Am luat un joc. Noi că mai. See, since Prabhat has actually said it all, let me just dwell on just two issues. One is expanding on the last bit of what Prabhat said, which is that what appears remarkable is the poor economic advice that the government either received or if it received better advice, that that advice was simply ignored. I doubt whether it was, I tend to agree with Prabhat, that the advice itself seems to have been, at least, even if there were some doubts, it wasn't expressed with the firmness it should. It was accepted, I mean, that you know, if the leadership wants it, that's the way it's going to be. I think that's one thing I want to talk about. But before coming to that, let me just dwell on something which is really a corollary of what Prabhat said. Uh, what we are watching on TV today is a difficulty of people to exchange their uh, cash. And this is showing up in people feeling let down. A lot of people have felt that it's not a good thing, but things are going to work itself out. And as the days go by, I think there's a sense of, you know, I want my charaza rupee at least, or at least I want to get to the bank, I want to see the thing working. And the whole thing seems to be simply not working on the ground. So that's a different type of failure, which is the thing seems to have been badly planned. That is, the government simply didn't know how many people would turn up, how these ATMs need to be functioned, what it means to fill them up. Now all of this is what we see on television. Now this is one side of the story which is an extremely important side of the story, but it's a different side of the story than the one Prabhat pointed to. The point Prabhat pointed to at the last part of his thing was really that what really is worrying about what the government has done is the impact it's going to have on the economy. That is on the demand in the economy and therefore on what is produced and what people get in terms of incomes, not in terms of money from bank, but in terms of <coughs> incomes generated, jobs generated and all that. Now how are the two linked? How is the fact that people are not getting money linked to this issue of the implications for demand in the economy. Now it's linked very simply to the fact that the government decided one fine morning that from this midnight this is illegal currency and we'll be doing you a favor if you line up for over the next month and a bit and take whatever ration we have given you of the extent to which you can exchange your money. Or you put that money in the bank and withdraw it from the bank by withdrawal slips. Now in all of this, of course, it put a great deal of stress, immediate stress on the banking system. And I think all of us should recognize that the guys working in the banking system should be people we should be completely sympathetic with. They're doing an amazing job. And nonetheless, people are going to be shouting at them. People will say, you can't give me the money, the queues are very long. And that's another side of where you have not calculated what the system can deliver, what sort of pressures it can put on people. And 
and that's the other side of it. But really, what happens? What happens is this, that the government has taken 86% of your total money supply and removed it. <coughs> it's taken 86% of the total money supply and removed it. So the economy is left with roughly 14% of the money supply on that day. That's all that was legal. Now obviously that can't continue. However much in the long run you would like to be, and it's one of the open things as Prabhat said, that people want to move towards a cashless society. A lot of people see this as a situation which will bring, bring about behavioral change. People will actually look at banking and the government will say you have created all this Jandhan Yojana. Most people now have some sort of a bank account, although most of them are, were lying empty so far. But a fair amount of bank accounts have been created. Most of them, a lot of them, had no deposits at all or one rupee deposits. But the idea was that we've created that infrastructure, now go and make use of it, and something like this would be a behavioral change. People would suddenly start putting in the money, and this would sort of have this huge change in the way the Indian economy works. It would move from a huge cash economy to a cashless economy. Now let me say one or two things about this cashless economy business. If you look at the literature on this, for Google on this, you'll find a lot of things which will tell you that India's cash, that is the amount of cash currency in the system, is about 12% of GDP. And then you'll be comparing this, in all of this, with certain countries. Britain is about four, and then you'll find some developing countries also as four, and then you'll hear the thing that we've got three times as much cash in our economy as these other countries. It's 12 instead of four. What they don't tell you is that the average for all members of the Bank of International Settlements is roughly about 8%. So we are more, but we are not all that much more. It's not like triple, it's a bit more. And if you take some particular countries, for example, the country in which our Prime Minister was still this morning, <laughs> Japan has a currency GDP ratio of 20%, which is substantially higher than ours. And you can actually go around Switzerland has about 10, and then obviously if it's four, if you've got some four and the average is about eight or nine, then some must have substantially more than that. So we are not odd. In fact, it would be odd if you're much less than 12, simply because more than half our economy is a cash economy. It runs on cash. It does not run on credit. It does not run on bank thing. Simply because 80, about 90% of our workforce is unorganized. They, are, they don't have a proper job. <coughs> they're either farmers or they're employed by on a casual daily basis in our entire agricultural sector is that way and most of a lot of our services sector is that way. Now if we've got an economy which is 50% or more which depends entirely on cash rather than on credit then obviously you'd expect the cash GDP ratio to be higher. So unless the nature of the economy itself starts changing, there are limits to how much you can do by changing people's behavior. You would be able to do some, but don't think that you would be able to do too much. I mean, unless you think that you know, you'll simply have 
a whole economy where the farmer will give his farm labor, you know, a check. Or, <laughs> you know, and that farm labor will then take this check. And, you know, it's, that could happen one day, but it certainly isn't going to happen tomorrow. And it certainly is not going to happen between the 8th of November and 30th of December. Okay? So, there is a structural issue out there. And it is in this structural issue that the other side of the coin, that is people lining up and not getting cash, the other side of that coin is when they don't get cash, they don't spend it. And if they don't spend it, the cash economy takes a fit. Okay? And that's where the recessionary impact comes and how large it would be we don't really know. It depends entirely on how much can be injected back so that whatever was destroyed of that 86%, how much of that gets back in the form of new currency which the people have so that they again start spending. Again, a big sign of total and utter incompetence of the way you have actually gone in this is that people have been given 2,000 rupee notes. Yeah, wherever you go, nobody is giving you 100 rupee notes. <laughs> they are giving you 2,000 rupee notes. Now, there is a sense in which I can see how it happened. People were told, ki itna hazar karod, roughly, we are taking out about 15, 14 to 15,000 crore lakh. 14 to 15 lakh crores in the form of 500,000. Now, in order to fill that up, it would require a long time to print new 100 rupee notes. So, let's actually print 2,000 rupee notes so that we have to print fewer notes. And that's what really has been done. You are getting very few, even the 500 rupee notes being distributed, what you are getting is 2,000 rupees. Now what happens? You've got those notes, but people are not giving you change for it. So you've got notes, you've got currency, which, unless you're willing to spend all 2,000 of it, is really a very limited currency to have. So the ability of that as a legal tender has very limited usefulness for the person, but it's also very limited in its ability to create demand as quickly as possible. So you've got to actually work itself out, see how all of these, a sequence of mistakes after mistakes, finally solve themselves. Possibly, and I'm sure at some point, you will get back to normal. The money will come back to normal. The issue is how long does it take? And however long it takes, the longer it takes, it will be worse for the economy. <coughs> now, <coughs> nonetheless, it is also the case that a lot of people were willing to say, look here, the government has done a damn good thing. It has shown a great deal of guts in doing something which was unpopular, but it was necessary, we had to do it. So, you know, there is a certain, you know, strength and that's what the government showed. Now, obviously, it will wear thin the longer it runs. So, unfortunately for the economy, the government will be I mean, there was a certain amount on which the people trusted the government. But the more the economy gets into problem, the less trust there will be for the government. And I think that's possibly even more important in terms of the bad advice that the government received. Now, to show how bad an advice it is, let me actually take the opposite. Suppose the government had not, suppose Modi ji 
on 8th of November had not announced that from midnight today this will be this. Suppose he had announced something else. Suppose he had announced that we have decided that we stop printing these notes, 500,000, from midnight tonight. So nobody will get new notes of 500,000. And that these notes will cease to be legal currency on the 30th of December. And in between, people are welcome to go and exchange them in the banks. Suppose he had done that, what would, it, would have been the difference between what they have done now and what they have, would have done then? The two are not very different. That advice, I'm sure any sensible economist would have said, they consider this as an option. Well, what would have happened? First, you won't see all these long queues. It would have been more or less normal, people would have gone and changed, and just to get an idea, in 2014, or was it 2012, I, remember, I forget exactly, we actually did that. Currencies which were printed before 2005 were declared to be, with a lag of one month, to be stopped. And people did change it. But you didn't see, you know, such huge lines and things happening. Now, if you, but at that time, you, it was only for 500. There was no muscle flexing, there was no saying, we'll stop it. But suppose you did that. You said, 30th of December, And you said, if you wanted to be serious about this black money part of it, that we are going to follow it. There is some chap who deposits in his bank a huge amount, the bank will be instructed to tell the income tax agents. Which is precisely what is happening now, because people can change. They can deposit in the bank. It's just that if they deposit too much, the bank will tell the income tax. You could have done that without having this thinky do it today. Suppose you did that as well. Now those guys, what would they have done? I don't know what they are doing today, obviously some of them are just holding back. Others, if the newspapers tell us, are finding various ways in which to convert it. And some, as Modi ji told us on TV today, are throwing it into the Kalpa. So they are doing a number of things. What would you have done if you were one such guy? You would have thought, okay, I can either put it in the bank and then pay the tax, whatever the income tax guys do, or I cheat as I am doing now, or I just go out and spend. Okay, one way of actually going about is to spend. Okay, you can either keep your money and you don't throw it to the Ganga, you don't. But who spent then, what would have happened? An economy which is in recession would actually have had a certain increased amount of demand. So that in fact if you had done it the other way, instead of throwing the economy into a into a recessionary direction, you know, actually injected demand because you told the guy who's got all this money sitting there and he's keeping it there because it's supposedly this stuff that he keeps in his cupboard. Most people don't, by the way. But whatever money is being kept in the cupboard would now come out and be spent. Now, if such simple economics either eludes our economists or they are scared of saying it that simply, there is something very, very wrong.